lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for me and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Majesty, Lord of all, let every throne before him fall, the King of kings, O come adore, our God who reigns victorious in the strife for those he came to save his glories now we sing who died and rose on high who died eternal life to lives that death may die. Majesty, Lord of all, let every throne before him fall, the King of kings, O come adore our God who reigns forever. Lord of all, let every throne before him fall, the King of kings, O come adore, our God who reigns forevermore, majesty. Oh, come adore. Oh.
chapter 8 does for all of us. It is God wrapping his loving arms around us and saying to us, in effect, now I've got this. Everything's going to be all right. So this week we're going back to Genesis, to a fascinating passage in Genesis chapter 45, beginning at verse 1. And it is the continuing saga of Joseph, who is a type and an illustration of our kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the title of this message is Our Kinsman Redeemer. So if you have a Bible close by, wherever you are, take it up and read along with me, Genesis chapter 45, beginning at verse one. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Well, the last time that I met with you in this fashion, I shared a portion of this story with you, which was entitled Corn in Egypt. Jacob's observation on that occasion was this. There is no need for us to perish when there's corn aplenty in Egypt. And when his sons would not immediately respond to his message, he then questioned them, why stand ye gazing at one another? In other words, what are you waiting for? That's a question that every unsaved sinner needs to be asked in the world that you and I live in. Please remember that a famine had spread across the Middle East and especially so in the land of Canaan where Jacob and his sons were living. Jacob had heard by some means that there was corn in Egypt and he had dispatched his sons to purchase the precious grain. Now the sons of Jacob were for the most part a pretty sorry lot of people. 
These boys had sold their brother into slavery in a jealous rage. They had participated in the massacre of the entire adult male population of the city of Shechem. They were a bitter, angry, cantankerous bunch. And when they set out for Egypt, I wonder if they did so hoping that they would not run into the brother, their long lost brother, whom they had sold into slavery years before. Little did they realize that their worst fears would soon come true. When they did arrive in Egypt, they were taken immediately before Joseph, who by then had risen to the position of prime minister in Egypt. But those boys in his presence did not at first recognize him. You see, the boy that they had known so long ago had long since become a man. The boy who had once proudly worn the coat of many colors given to him by a loving father was now arrayed in the regal robes of the second in command in all of Egypt. It is understandable, then, how they did not recognize him. So when we come to Genesis 45, the scene changes radically, for these boys are going to discover that Joseph is alive, and not only that, but he is governor of all the land, which must have been a double shock. For the first time in a long time, they are looking upon him whom they have pierced through with many sorrows, as was recorded in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. They will look upon the son who was despised and rejected by them, and they must now do business with the one whose very life they would have forfeited had not a caravan of slave traders happened by to prevent them from killing their brother. It is all a picture of Jesus and the manner in which he was treated during his ministry on the earth. So as we think about this text and as we think about this scene, we ought to learn some lessons this morning. And the first is this, in this text, there was a revelation. We read of the scene, Joseph made himself known unto his brethren, verse one. Since none of the brothers recognized Joseph when they saw him at first, no one could reveal his identity except Joseph himself. Joseph, I suppose, could have kept his identity a secret and I'm fairly certain his brothers never would have recognized him, but he deliberately and willfully chose to reveal himself to his own kinsmen. Now that's significant for this reason. In the heart of man, there is a God consciousness. In our deepest souls and in our deepest spirits, we know whether we will ever admit it publicly or privately, that there is a God, and that becomes a great fear in the lives of many. Universally, men through the years have worshiped some, some God, and they've done it throughout the entirety of the history of mankind. So what some refer to as an atheist is really a misnomer. It's an outrageous use of a word, for a man would have to do violence to his own nature to deny the existence of God when his soul and spirit within him testify to the existence of God. It would be therefore a crime against his own soul and spirit, for that soul and spirit both will testify of the existence even if we mentally deny the existence of God. But the truth is that most men do not deny the existence of God. Instead, what they prefer to do is to fashion a God after their own making. For instance, in ancient Greece, the people worshiped many gods. The Greeks, in the midst of their idolatry and paganism, fashioned gods for themselves after their own imaginations and in their own images. They thought of their gods as being impersonal and uninterested in the affairs of men. The Greeks thought their gods were like they were, selfish and sinful. 
They believe that their gods involve themselves in the affairs of men only to satisfy their own lusts. The Greeks and the Romans after them fashioned images of those idols, and then they put them on display in their Parthenons, which means the house, the houses of the gods. And they were always willing to add a new god to the list for fear that they would fail to pay homage to what is referred to in scripture as the unknown god, as was the case in Corinth and Athens. At the very same time in history, if you went down into Africa, deepest, darkest Africa, you would have found another branch of idolatry. But their gods in Africa did not look like those of the Greeks and the Romans. They believed in the existence of a god or gods. And they too fashioned their gods in their own image after their own imaginations. You see, the fact is that if men are left to their own devices, we never would really know what God is like. In order for men then to really know who God is and what he is like, then God must reveal himself to us for we are just like the brothers of Joseph who did not recognize their own brother even when they stood face to face with him. But he has revealed himself to us. God has revealed himself to us. And he's done this in two distinct forms. First, he's done it in the form of the written word of God. And the second revelation is in the form of the living word, that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And both of these revelations are found within the confines of one volume, and that is the Bible that you hold in your hands. The revelation of the Savior within the Bible corresponds with the revelation of Joseph to his wicked brothers in these respects. First, there was a revelation of one who had been rejected. The Apostle John would write it like this. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew or recognized him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. You'll find that in John 1, verses 10 through 11. The great old prophet Isaiah looked 750 years further with the eye of faith and with the eye of prophecy, and he wondered aloud who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. In my mind, I can almost imagine that the brothers of Joseph were trying to hide their faces when Joseph revealed himself to them. But this is a common experience with the Savior, for I fear that there are far more who have rejected him than those who have received him. And that's why Jesus will one day talk about a broad way that leads to destruction as opposed to a narrow way that leads to to life everlasting. Secondly, it was a revelation of a guilty past. They were troubled, verse 3 says, at Joseph's presence. And well, they should have been troubled, but what about our past? And not only that, what about our present sins? When Christ is revealed to any soul for what and who he is, then our sins are sure to stand out and to become glaring and troubling in our own minds. When Isaiah saw the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6, he cried aloud, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King of the Lord of hosts. When he finally saw God as he really is, then Isaiah saw himself as he really was. Third, it was a revelation of a real kinship. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, your brother, verse four. But know this, while they were brothers in the flesh, at that moment they were not brothers in spirit and in soul. And while Christ holds a kinship to all men, 
in the sense that he once shared a body of flesh. He does not share a kinship with all men in soul and in spirit. You see, the Lord Jesus is the absolute spirit of holiness. He is the embodiment of righteousness, God's righteousness. But you and I are sinners, every one of us. But he can be, by our faith, our brother and friend, that friend that sticketh closer than a brother. But it is only by faith in his shed blood on Calvary's cross and by our willingness to crown him Lord of our lives that we can come into this vital union and relationship with him. Fourth, there is a revelation of great grace here in this text. Joseph said, Now therefore be not grieved that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. You think about what he said to those boys. That's a remarkable thing, and that is exactly the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, for he has come to seek and to save that which was lost, or so said Luke's gospel. Do you remember how these boys had treated Joseph? Why, they would have murdered him had it not been by God's grace and by God's providence that that caravan of traitors came near just at the moment those boys were about to murder Joseph. If Joseph had ordered their immediate execution, we would hardly have blamed him. We would have said he would have been justified in doing so. Instead, he deals with these boys in love and in mercy, and thank God that's how Jesus wants to deal with us. Now that is the revelation that we have of the Lord. But think of this. What happens if we reject that revelation and turn to another? What if we, we go off of the, the beaten path of the truth of the scripture regarding who Jesus was and what he is and seek another revelation of our own making? Years ago, my wife and I had the Disney Channel in our home uh, when our children were small. Walt Disney once uh, wanted to illustrate how artists will see things differently. And so he commissioned four professional artists that were on his staff to paint a picture of a tree, the same tree. They were all given paints and brushes and the exact same size canvas. They all traveled together to the site and were given exactly the same amount of time to produce their representation of a weathered old tree. Well, one of the artists was a realist, and so when he painted the picture of that tree, he painted it exactly as he saw it. It was just an illustration of that tree. But there was another artist who was an abstract artist, and his painting took on frightening aspects. He used dark, dreary colors and sharp lines, and the tree looked altogether different than the one painted by the realist. But a third artist was a modern artist. And so he took brush and paints in hand and with bright pastels, he painted a third picture altogether different from the first two. And finally there was a fourth artist and he only used black and white and made his depiction of that tree in that form. Disney displayed the paintings and said, here are four professional artists all looking at the same thing, but all seeing it differently. But that is exactly what men do when they begin to fashion a God for themselves. Therefore, if we reject the revelation of God and his son, which is found in scripture, then we're no better than the ancient Greeks or Romans or Africans who fashioned out of their own imagination idols of mud, wood, brick, bronze, and stone for themselves. Fifth, this revelation <clears throat> is finally followed by a commission, and folks, that's the way God always does it. Haste ye, Joseph said, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt and come down unto me. Tarry not. I've learned in my ministry through the years 
that there are a great many people who have attempted to serve God without having first had a real experience of grace with the Lord. We are not ready for a commission from God until we have first of all been converted by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a second great lesson to be learned here from this text and it involves the reception that the news that Joseph was alive, how that news was received. When the aged Jacob heard the news, he at first doubted, and the scripture says Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. Somehow that's just the typical reaction that the gospel of Christ receives by unsaved sinners. At first, they tend to doubt and not to believe. It often takes time. Sometimes they have to go through a struggle in their hearts and minds before they will come to Christ and believe. Always, it is almost always the case that they will doubt and do not believe. I remember hearing and understanding the gospel for the first time when I was six years of age. We lived in Tampa, Florida then, and my dad was overseas. And my mother took my sister and I to a revival meeting at the First Baptist Church there in Tampa. I remember the preacher's last name. It was Smith, but I don't remember his first name. But I do vividly to this day remember that service. I understood that night that I needed to come to the Savior. But the truth of the matter is, it would take 10 long years before I would finally come in faith, trusting Christ as my Savior. Then we read in our text, when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, he said, it is enough. That's in verse 27. In other words, when he saw the evidence with his own eyes, his eyes of faith were then opened. Before a sinner believes, he must realize his own need for a Savior before he will respond. And then he decided, for he said, Joseph is alive and I will go. You see, real faith always leads to action. That's why here in our church, we always close our services with an invitation, inviting any and all who will to come to Christ. Those who are really saved are always willing to respond and to come. And remember folks, Jesus has no secret disciples. Then finally Jacob possessed something, for Joseph gave them a possession in the best of the land that's found in chapter 47 and verse 11. It was the land of Goshen, a rich, fertile area. And in that area, Jacob's family, because of the blessing given to him by Joseph, would grow rich and prosperous over time. To receive Christ's invitation is to become an heir to an eternal inheritance. What God has, we inherit because of what Christ did for us. And we possess all that God has by faith. So I want to close this morning by asking you a simple question. Right where you are, in your home or wherever you are, are you ready to come to Christ today? Right now, at this moment, you can pray the sinner's prayer. Father, I confess and acknowledge my sins. I'm coming to you today in faith, believing that Jesus died for me on the cross. You see, friend, you can be saved, and then you can possess all that God has in store for you. Bow with me, please. Father in heaven, it is with a grateful heart that we come before you today, having heard this marvelous story from Scripture and seeing how you saved a family through the blessing of Joseph's life and attitude and ministry. I remember, Father, in reading this story, how Jesus did the very same thing for all of us. Father, that cross was your greatest gift to mankind. And believing that Jesus died for us, 
we look in faith to him today. Father, save that soul that stands nearest to hell today. Bless that dear saint who is having trouble or problem or wavering in any way. Help us all, Father, to always cling in faith to your promises from your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.